a podcast made by Watford fans, fans for Watford fans from the rookery end. Welcome to From the Rookery End. It's a video. Yeah, a video. Bizarre. Uh, it's Sunday, the 1st of May, and yesterday Watford played Aston Villa, and they won. Hurrah! 3-2 uh, against the bottom of the league side. Um, we, as always, uh, this is going to be a video, uh, but uh, it's still going to be us talking about our take on life as a Watford fan. My name's John, and uh, that's Mike. Morning. Sorry, I look absolutely dreadful. Uh, I blame <laughs> the light. Okay. Um, yeah, it's the light. Of course. Uh, Mike, uh, let, let's have a look at the game yesterday. Uh, in many ways, it was just a little bit of a, a bizarre game of football. Yeah, it was strange in a lot of ways. It was strange in a lot of ways. Obviously, it had a great ending. But I thought the first 20 minutes was, was really, really good. And that was a real positive. I looked, looked at Andy almost in disbelief, my brother who sits next to me at, at games. And after Villa went ahead and we sort of... He had to laugh, really, because we had been completely dominant until, until Villa went ahead. So it was... It sucked the life out of everyone, didn't it, really, after when, when they went ahead. But it was a really positive, I thought, um, opening spell to the game, which was really what we were crying out for after after the performance uh, uh, at Wembley on Sunday. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I like, the fact that Villa went ahead first, was their fans and the, the joy that they had from scoring that one goal. Um, and they need a little bit of joy. I think every relegated team needs a little bit of joy. Um, yeah, that gallows, gallows humour. It's usually us that's having to indulge in that sort of thing, isn't it? And, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think Watford fans gave them a, a massive round of applause at one, at one stage, which was quite nice, but I thought I felt sorry for the Villa fans because how patronising. They were sort of singing a song, mocking themselves, and Watford fans sort of yeah, clapped along saying, yes, yes, we agree, you are absolutely hopeless and, and you're right to mock yourselves because you are dreadful. It was, yeah, uh, well, there you go. Yeah, my, was... my, my, the, the phase of the game that sort of got me a little bit was that in the second half, where because they'd gone ahead twice, um, they were able to stick... Let's say eleven. It felt like at least eleven men behind the ball, um, and it sort of made Watford look like we were just passing sideways. Um, in, there wasn't that sort of impetus to. There was an impetus to go forward. Uh, there was control of the ball going forward. Um, there was many many passes and, and keeping control of the, of the game. Um, but there was that lack of sort of you know weaving something out of um, to, to to get a few more shots on target, uh, especially with that starting um, that starting eleven that we had. It didn't seem to be able to find a, a second uh, way of getting the ball uh, near to uh, near to the goal for where a shot might be be useful. Uh, but let's let's think. Of, oh, it's been the on. case so often, John. Though, hasn't it? That's that. That yeah. is the issue with that's the issue that we've had all season. Is that and it was encapsulated. I'm not going to talk about it again after this. I promise. But it was encapsulated at Wembley on on Sunday. They had the Zaha and Balassi who got the ball bombed forward and sort of, just, right, we'll worry about what we're going to do with this bit of possession in this dangerous part of the field once they were there. And um, Watford, for whatever reason, the way they're set up or, or the personnel that we've got, that, that hasn't been the case. And yet, like, as you rightly point out, that was that was evident yesterday against Villa. Uh, let's go for it. Let's go for three bad and three good from yesterday's game. Uh, I'm going to go with, my first, I'll go with the first bad. I'm going to go with my initial feeling when I saw the bench. And the fact it did miss Holabas, it did miss Barami, uh, and maybe there, you know, that one little youth player, Jakubiak, maybe just being on there, yeah, you know, the desire that knowing that this season is pretty much done and dusted, um, a little bit of, I don't know. I don't think it, I don't think it was, I don't think it was, I think you're right to to pick up on the fact that um, it was a it was a largely unchanged team, but I think the players, the key players that people will perhaps have been hoping to see a bit of were. With Burkhouse, who I'm sure we'll we'll come to, on to talk about a little bit about later, and Amrabat, guys who have got that little bit extra. Um, Burkhouse did did well against West Ham, and we know that Amrabat offers something slightly different going forward. So I think they would have been the ones that that people were disappointed not to see. Perhaps do you, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I, I do. But I suppose it was wanting to see them, but just a wild card, I suppose. Um, was, was yeah, what yeah. I, I wish to have seen. Go give give us a, a bad from your point of view. One of the guys who did who had a really bad day yesterday, I thought was was Paredes, and I think you know had to be a real wearing really rose tinted glasses to to not accept that he had a, had a bad game, and he was rightly rightly substituted sort of quite early in the in the second half, if I recall. Actually, he had a he had a similar torrid time up at Villa Park. He um he just seems to have these funny games where he doesn't really seem at it. He just seems. I don't know. I don't know if it's concentration. We all have bad days at the office, I guess. But but this was definitely one, and he was rightly substituted. But 
I cringed, I winced at the at the crowd reaction, and I know there was an air of frustration about the place because we were struggling against Villa, who are in turn struggling. Um, so I get that, but the sort of the cheering when when he went off, I just thought was yeah. I, I just it just shows a no. lack of empathy for for the player himself because it's almost as if he was doing it on purpose. No one no one turns in a poor performance uh, on purpose unless you're uh, a, a Pakistani cricketer, obviously. Um, can we be sued for this? Anyway. No. Uh, <laughs> Not factual, correct. They're, they're sitting in courts. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, you you take you, you get the point. I don't, and I just I knew it was coming. And, and the other thing I was worried about was it was half-time if we hadn't equalised the booze. And it's just, I always, I, I, I'll defend anyone's right to to um to get their views out how they see fit you know I, you know I know I make enough I rant and rave about about certain things when other people are quiet so I do accept that that people pay their money they have a choice they can make whatever noise they want but I do, I do think just to cheer someone being substituted off I just think I, I yeah, find no. that tough I found that tough I was I was disappointed with it I understand perhaps why people did it but but for me I didn't enjoy that it didn't feel I don't know. I, I don't, doesn't feel like the football supporter thing to do for me. No, it didn't feel didn't didn't feel right at the time. That's for sure. Uh, mm. The last bad. Um, let's not dwell on the bads too much. Um, seeing Aman Abdi at right back, which was just bizarre. Um, I, I know it sort of came out of the fact that that uh, Kike made substitutions to to get the the attack sort of varying that by putting on Berghaus and putting on um, uh, Amrabat, but. Um, he was a little lost, and I never like looking at Alman in a place where he doesn't look like the great man that we all he, know he is. The, the, and the, the, the sort of bad, the real bad thing about it is we know he can't tackle. It's like watching a drunk Paul Scholes trying to tackle when when Alman goes in for a challenge. So that was, and he, I think more than anything, you just feel a bit sorry for for Alman himself, who over the last couple of years has been one of our. You know, I think he's everyone's. Everyone's got a real soft spot for Alman Abdi, hasn't he? For the for the things he's done for the football club over the last couple of years, and to see him sort of shunted out onto the right, and then like you say, um, slotting in at right back yesterday. But I'll, I mean, I guess the proof of the pudding was, was in the eating, and it freed up other players to perhaps do what needed to be done to um, to get the win. So um, we had uh, Amrabat and Anya were doing doing good stuff down the left hand side, um, especially after Villa went down to te- down to ten men. Um, and Amrabat, um, no, sorry, Berghaus down down the right. So it worked, um, but I agree, it was sort of quite. It was just sort of a bit not depressing. Uncomfortable. Is the wrong word. Yeah, yeah. You don't. You almost think, oh, any player. Basically, if you're a professional footballer, you should play where you're told to play. I get that, but it was just a bit sad, really. I thought to see him sort yeah. of um, in there, right when we had Neom on uh, on the bench. Whether that says anything about about Neom's future at the club, I don't know. Uh, but we had a, a, a right back on the bench; he could have come on. We didn't use all three subs, so um, I guess he had his reasons. But yeah, it was a bit a bit forlorn, wasn't it? Seeing seeing poor old Alman at right back, not not his place, is it? Okay, they're the bad. Let's go on with the good. Um, give us a good from the game, Mike. Well, can we stick with Alman Abdi? Yeah. He scored a free kick, and what a cracker it was. That's the Alman yeah. Abdi we know. Alman Abdi. Alman Abdi. Yeah. And I think that was our first free kick, the goal we've scored from a free kick all season. So, well, it feels, um, like the first time, it feels like the first time he's taken a free kick, and because he yeah. got the foul to get it, I yeah. remember he sort of picked up the ball, and a bunch of people sort of surround it who were fancy taking the free kick. Yeah. But I said to Rich, who I said next to you, I said, Alman's got the ball, he's going to take it. Yeah. Um, because he's not the normal penalty, yeah, the free kick taker. He did straight in the bottom corner. Um, classic um, and Abdi. It was inch perfect as well. It just just got over the um, just got over the uh, the uh, the Villa wall and uh, crept in at the bottom right hand corner. It was um, absolute textbook. Really good to see. Really good to see. The other really good thing to see. Uh, I'm gonna give my second good. Uh, is gonna be Troy Deeney banging in goals. Uh, mm. We he has scored goals. Um, but the fact that he scored two in a game feels like something we haven't seen for a while. Um, also seeing his celebrations in front of the Aston Villa fans made it even more perfect. Uh, but also the fact that he's now in double figures. And yeah. I know he's a striker and uh, he doesn't technically really have to. You know, we know what he does for this team. He doesn't have to score all the goals. But it just makes maybe the outside world just make sure their judgments of uh, of Troy Deeney 
make a little bit more like our true judgments. We know what he does for us as, as a captain, as a, a week in, week out player. Um, but the fact he's gone past uh, onto 11 goals now yeah. just really is fantastic for him in his, his first year in the Premier League. And the great, the great thing about them, John, was well, was the with the first one was like a real header, like the bully that we know Troy Deeney is. He made sure he got there first, very much like the one he got at Villa in front of the Holt end uh, early on in the season. And then the the other one, he showed real composure, I thought, to get himself set because the ball came out to him quite quickly. It ricocheted around in the box, and he set himself um, and hit it sweetly into into the bottom right hand corner. So that shows, I think we've spoken earlier in earlier podcasts, that Troy Deeney's not just all bluster and effort and um you know big herculean effort he's he actually is is a, is a decent footballer with with some really nice touch a quick footballing brain um and i thought that showcased um troy's talents really really nice and like you say it's great that he's into into double figures uh, to have two strikers in the premier league in in double figures is is amazing really i mean it really um it's just really really good and yeah i agree i think it's um a feather in troy's cap at, Nice of him to get two from open play because, of course, he's got a couple of penalties. But, yeah, two two strikers in double figures in the Premier League as a promoted side. Magnificent. Really, really pleasing to see. Well done, Troy. OK, let's, you, you give me the third good. Uh, we mentioned him earlier. Stephen Burkhouse. I think people were hoping to see him in the, in the semi... Oh, I said I wouldn't mention it, so I won't. Uh, people were <laughs> maybe hoping to see him start, start the game against Villa, and, and he didn't, but he came on. Um, showed some really, really nice touches. I will so pre- preface this with a negative. If he does something wrong, he always tries to put his shorts up. Have you noticed this? He sort of pulls, <laughs> yeah. pulls the waistband of his shorts up. And I think, I was talking to Andy about this, he missed a goal, a chance. It might have been late on against Swansea or something like that. And he yeah. pulled his shorts up and ripped them to bits, almost like a cross between Hulk Hogan and... Um, I don't know Superman or something ripping his uh, ripping his clothes apart, and he did it yesterday. And I was like, "Leave your shorts alone, Burkhouse." Probably maybe that's why he's not <laughs> hasn't been in the team. But I thought he showed some really nice touches. We spoke earlier about um, the lack of not ability but flair going forward, the lack of drive, and he sort of seemed to address that a little bit. And I know it was really it was only only a cameo performance, and yeah. and I'm assuming he he hasn't been in the side for for a host of reasons, but. I think it, it was a really positive display for him, and the ball that he played in for for Deeney's goal, the cross yeah. in from the from the right hand side, which Deeney met with his head for the for the first for the second equaliser, was absolutely beautiful. Put yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah. a vicious arc. He had enough pace on it that Deeney all he had to do was guide it in. Um, it was textbook, and it was um, really really good to see. And I think a run of a run of games for for Burkhouse for the rest of the season will be. Interesting to see if he can do it. You know, we've got some tough games coming up. Uh, Norwich away, Liverpool away, and then and then Sunderland at home. Who'll be fighting for their lives? So these these are these are big games. And of course, if he does perform well, there's going to be a huge question mark. Why wasn't he in the side earlier? It's yeah, it's always it's always the man who doesn't play who's the answer. It used to be McNamee. It used to be Wooster if he was on the bench. Get them on. Get them on. It's always the man who's not playing that's the answer. So. It was good that when he came in yesterday, he did have a, a really positive impact. I wonder if we're going to get a chance to see him for the for the rest of the season, and I, I hope he can do it. But with it, what well, if he's going to be what? If he is going to be what for player, he next year. This is the perfect time for him to get games under his his belt. Um, they are tougher games against tough sides. That's the education he needs. Um, but what we don't, you know, what I if if it does happen and he does start shining. I know that everyone always wants the next player, the player who's not playing, to be in the squad. But it will start raising the question, why was he not included in squads, in cameo appearances, in pushing us through in the last 15 minutes of a game earlier in the season? Mm. Um, if, it's not, is it, if it's not for his ability or his development, then what were the choices um, that, that were made? Well, that's this is, this is an argument head, that a lot of... That a lot of people who are uh, not anti Kike, but but people who have been more um, vociferous, shall we say, with their arguments, they suggest that that Sanchez Flores has its fa- has his favourites and will stick with those um, for whatever reason, and and perhaps that Burkhouse has fallen foul of that. And I, th- I think Geordie mentioned, I think he shared a, a tweet last night or a or a clip of a a um, message he'd had from one of his friends in Spain who had said that some of the criticisms in Spain of Kike Sanchez-Flores was that he stuck to certain groups of players 
when the evidence was that they perhaps should have been replaced with someone else. Now, that's one school of thought. The other thing, of course, is that he's the boss. He sees them in training week in, week out. We don't get to see that. We're not privy privy to that. Is his How's his attitude in training? What's his performance like in training? How's he um, fitted in with the way Kike Sanchez Flores has wanted to play in training? And perhaps he hasn't hasn't done the business necessarily. I mean, he's obviously a good player. There was he had a good reputation when when um, we signed him. Doing a little bit of research about him when he when he came, and and it looked like there had been a bit of interest around him. Um, so he's obviously a decent player, but we'll never know the true story. What I'd like is that he's come on now. He's, uh, he's 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 played he's played well. He's made a very very strong case for him to to feature in the next couple of games, um, and hopefully there, there could be a Watford career ahead of him. Uh, we'll see what happens. Um, thank you very much for for watching this little from the rookery end uh, that we've done. Um, we had to do it because it feels good. Football feels good again, John, doesn't it? We were miserable uh, last yeah. week, but how what well, how good is a last minute winner? It just made, does make it all worthwhile, doesn't it? I know it's a bit a bit two faced. We were sort of moaning last week, and now we're all happy, but. That's what football's about, isn't it? You've got to take the rough with the smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the, that's the good stuff. Uh, hopefully the ups are more, even bigger and better ups are on the way. Uh, remember, you can listen to the podcast. Um, we did one this week, chatting about the probable exit of uh, Kike Sanchez-Flores. Uh, make sure you go to fromtherookend.com or search us on iTunes and press subscribe as you do so. Um, but we're also after your top 10 of the season. Not just the top 10 games, the top 10 moments on the pitch. Anything that is top 10 that you think was just a nice little cherry for this first season back in the Premier League. And we can say that now. It is only the first season back in the Premier League because now we are all mathematically lovely and into a second season in the Premier League with some yellow and black nets. We are staying up. We are staying up. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Uh, My name's John. He's Mike. Uh, and this is from the Rookery. A podcast made by Watford fans, fans for Watford fans from the Rookery end.